two? Yes. Documents only have one. Which one do you have? I have this one. Okay, here you go. This one? Okay, yeah, I got it. Okay. Take a look at the topics of the Zero Hour Public School. I mean, from lines to two city charter division. Okay. Yep. Okay. All right. Go ahead. It should be up. I thought it was already up. There we go. Mm -hmm. Just pull it down a little bit towards you. There you go. Okay. Thank you for having us, commissioners. I'm Jennifer. And just to start out uh, going through the documents you have in front of you, we wanted to kind of propose a, a first step that we think might be valuable as we proceed with the research that we've been providing you for a little bit of time now. Um, and, and this is reflected in some of the research that we've unfolded is that kind of rooting um, ourselves in a discussion of values that can help direct where uh, changes to a charter goes can be really beneficial. Um, I think, you know, what you'll see in the research that we uh, you have in front of you is that we're presenting a bunch of options on different types of changes that can be made to a charter, um, but really what you might want to elevate and what you might want to choose among those options could be focused a bit if we um, have a conversation or hear a little bit about what the you know primary value you might be promoting would look like. Would you mind repeating your name so we know who you are and uh, so who we can give credit to and uh, <laughs> all sorts of accolades? And also, uh, where are you? Are you master's candidates or PhDs or uh, just, you know, what your role is at the university? Sure, apologies, should have started with that, but I'm, I'm Jennifer and I'm a master's student. Um, and when we, before each of us, present, would it be okay for us to give our name? I'm, I'll, I'll be passing Jennifer, the baton. Jennifer, do you, you do have a last name. <laughs> I do, uh, and Jennifer Mann, M-A-N-N, -N, Mann. Thank you. Um, so again, as, as I was mentioning, you know, we've, we're going to be showing you some options based on other charters that we've been looking at and what's been proposed elsewhere and what has been promoted elsewhere based on, you know, charters that are, uh, have been recently revised and some that just are from governments that look a little bit different or similar to Flint for various reasons. And with that, we thought it might be valuable to think a little bit about how you want to structure the changes going forward and what those might look like and whether or not it might you know, the value you might be most interested in promoting would be, you know, effectiveness or efficiency or transparency, which are some of the ones we've seen promoted elsewhere. And I'll pass it on to Andrew to speak a little bit about um, specifically one of the other systems we've looked at and, and what, what they did as they were revising their charter. Thanks, Jennifer. So my name's Andrew Rising. I'm the lone bachelor's candidate in this group. I'm senior in the Ford School. So we really saw, as Jennifer said, that all the charter revisions we looked at are really informed by values. And charter, as you guys know, is a document that's inherently values-based, and when you change it, you change it with a specific value or set of values in mind. Um, we focused somewhat, and you see in the reports, we have lots of examples, but one of the ones we highlighted was the most recent revision of the Detroit City Charter, and we talked to charter commissioners and charter members in that charter revision, and they really wanted to emphasize the value of democratization. That was their main theme. Going in, they knew that the proposals for change wanted to focus on increasing access to government and the democracy, the democratic quality. Ways they did that were like switching from the at-large system of representation to a ward system to elect their councilmen. They created advisory committees to advise different departments within the government that citizens could join. And they developed a thing called the Corporation Council so a semi-independent body that can enforce the charter um, that had to be removed by both the mayor and council together, so it could um, bring suit against one party or the other to help enforce the charter, all with the main goal of democratization. So as we go through, we're gonna present the options, like Jen said, but it is helpful if we can think about values we have in mind as we're proposing this, and that's something that the Detroit Charter Commission figured out early, and then when they looked through their menu of options, they tended to highlight things that would increase democracy in the city.
Hi, my name is Caitlin Jacob. Um, I'm a master's student at Ford. And I'm Corey Ackerman. I'm also a master's student at Ford. Um, so we have spent the last month or two looking into the idea of charter enforcement um, and what that means when creating a charter. Um, and what we found overall was that a lot of this, um, when we talked to people, the idea of good charters that were easily enforced had a lot to do with the way the charter was set up, almost more so than um, after the fact accountability provisions. A lot of it was thinking about creating a charter that was easy to enforce, that was clear. Um, and one of the things that we looked at here, as you'll see in what the materials we provided for you, is that a charter um, with clear lines of responsibility um, is, is much easier to enforce. And by that, we mean when we talk to people, um, maybe it seems obvious, but like knowing exactly who is in charge of different, different pieces of the government, who's in charge of different processes, um, clear lines of responsibility for things happening. So when something goes wrong, you know who sort of needs to take responsibility for that. Um, but also you know who has control over different pieces. So um, the mayor and the council aren't fighting over, it's not ambiguous who's in charge in different situations. It's very clear. Um, and you don't wanna you know, give that um, too much detail. It's not every single employee and every line item in the budget, but it's the overall idea that you know which departments are responsible to who, you know who is responsible for the budget process and which pieces of the budget process. And it's just, it's very clear and explicit. Um, we also looked at um, sort of going along with that though, and we talked about this a little bit at the last meeting, thinking about creating a charter that's still flexible though. So you want a charter that's clear, but you don't want to lock yourself into situations that in 40 years are gonna cause problems. Um, the idea you want a charter that is long, um, won't, that is easy, you can still work with, um, even when unforeseen circumstances come up. Um, and so with that, while you want to be clear, that's what we were talking about when thinking about, for example, the budget. You don't want to get so detailed um, with you know, how much money can be in a reserve fund, for example, that in 25 years that really changes and it causes a problem. So you want a charter that lasts, um, a charter that's clear, a charter that lasts. Um, and we also looked at the possibility of um, thinking about checking in periodically to ensure the charter was in compliance with state law. Um, so as you guys are putting together this charter, um, obviously you're thinking about that, but um, sometimes state law changes, sometimes um, the process that is required for the budget is altered, um, and so having a check required that every few years maybe the city attorney or another individual is required to just do an audit, make sure that the process being followed by the city is in compliance with state law, and have a process for reaching out to the state for assistance. Um, if they find that they're out of compliance, just to ensure that the charter is continuing to work with state law. And then building off of that, another way to improve charter enforcement um, is the inclusion of accountability provisions. So we came across a few different types of these and what they would look like. Um, but the first type is thinking about penalties. So a few charters that we looked at that include specific penalty provisions are Dearborn, Pontiac, and Hamtramck. Um, now the, the drawback with including penalties for violating provisions of the charter, there is a potential drawback that having punitive measures or having strict punishment can deter future people from wanting to work for the city. That's always something you'd want to think about and balance. Um, but for example, one provision that we saw as, as effective was came from Dearborn, um, and they say that the council shall provide in each ordinance for punishment of up to 90 days imprisonment or $500 fine um, as otherwise permitted by law. So this has a very clear who is in charge of enforcing, what that enforcement is, and, it, and it's very specific. Again, that this gets back to the idea of flexibility and whether you want to include actual values. Um, but the inclusion of penalties in some form could be one way to improve accountability. So Pontiac, their charter is a little bit vaguer. They say the city shall provide punishment by ordinance. Um, and Hamtramck is actually the strictest that we found. And they actually say explicitly in the charter that a failure to comply with provisions can get you removed from office. The city attorney is responsible for doing that. And if they don't, citizens can. Um, so that's one type of accountability provision that we came across. 
Another is this idea of creating independent oversight bodies. So like we mentioned in Detroit, they created this corporation council which was responsible for enforcing the charter. Now we're not sure whether it makes sense to create a whole new body here in Flint, but the, the key element with the corporation council that we thought was interesting was this idea of independence that comes from who's hiring and who's firing. So this, the corporation council who was in charge for enforcement was, was appointed by the mayor but could only be fired by both the mayor and a supermajority of council. So I think from this we see a key takeaway is this idea of how do we create independent bodies and one way to do that would be through um, this hiring and firing process. And again, back to something Caitlin said earlier, um, is this idea of delineating the relationship between branches and being really clear about who does what. Um, and so two examples of this that we found were in Dearborn and Pontiac. So in Dearborn, they actually say um, the council, when they're deliberating over the budget, the mayor must provide access to all the information and the people that they want. Um, in Pontiac, they say explicitly lay out the council can request information from the mayor um, but can't order them around. So that's another, another way to improve accountability. Um, and then we also updated, so last, um, last meeting we talked a little bit about budget provisions, and so in your packet we've updated those a little bit. Um, and we just talked about a few other ideas around budget, budget best practices um, as an update to last time. So again, what Caitlin mentioned with having uh, periodic reviews to make sure you're in, in compliance with state law, and also thinking about how to um, include the council in more of a monitoring role throughout the whole process. So, for example, Detroit, they explicitly say that when a deficit is noticed, there must be a meeting with city council within a certain number of days. So just this ongoing monitoring role of council would be another, another um, method for increasing accountability that we came across. So now we will pass it to Jen and Andrew. So I believe you have these as two separate reports. We're going to be now focusing on the one that Jen and I wrote. Um, I think it's titled The Mayoral Powers. So in this report, we wanted to identify things that would be relevant and try to give you guys a menu of options to discuss and inform that menu through your own values and the values of the commission. Um, we saw the main ones that we wanted to focus were appointment and removals, veto powers, executive departments and executive organization, and mayoral duties laid out in the charter. So all those together um, encompass the mayoral powers we'd be focusing on. First, the appointment and removal powers. As you're all aware, that's the, um, one of the largest ways a uh, municipal executive can exercise authority and exercise a mandate. Um, and within these, we've come up with several different ways that um, they are governed in different cities. So you really can split this topic into three. You can have the appointment procedures, the removal procedures, and then any stipulations, restrictions, qualifications. With an appointment, we have mayoral appointment would be one system. This is all laid out in the document as well. Um, appointment by the mayor with advice and consent of the council, something similar to um, what's codified in the current charter of Flint. Professional appointment, appointment, which is, um, happens in other cities, and we documented language in the document as well, um, where a um, professional um, a person, either the city administrator, city manager, um, or another body would be responsible for appointing on a non-political basis, department heads, things like that. Split authority, an authority be shared between maybe two or three of those bodies, an executive, a council, and um, some sort of manager or chief administrative officer. And then finally, some cities even do elected administrators. So ordinary officials who might be um, appointed by the mayor in a city like Flint in other cities get elected by um, popular vote. So people like the uh, city attorney, um, city clerk are elected in a lot of instances. Sorry. Did any of the cities that you looked at have a system in which those individuals were elected? Election, yeah. It's in, I have charter language in the document as well, but um, the city we focused on in there was San Francisco. And um, whereas we're comparing cities for some of these options, and um, similarity to Flint is a big concern in some instances, and we think appointments or removals are one of these, we can get a real big sense of all the options out there by looking at a vast um, range of cities and not just focusing on those in Michigan or elsewhere, um, but we have all sorts of cities listed in the document. 
as far as removals go, we identified um, removal options that are roughly analogous to the appointment options. You have uh, removal by the mayor, grounds for removal, so grounds stipulated in the charter that lead to a removal of an officer. Um, a joint agreement, which is something like Detroit is implemented for their corporation council. The mayor and a supermajority of the council have to agree to remove somebody. And then some cities also use recall for even appointed officials, not just elected officials. Um, that's something we haven't studied as much because it's more rare. I don't think that's included in the document, but I wanted to bring it to your attention in the presentation. And then finally, qualifications and restrictions. Primarily in charter documents, these are residency um, qualifications that restrict the mayor's ability to appoint or anyone's ability to appoint based on the person's residency in the city. And then some charters also include professional, but they're mostly perfunctionary, like um, saying that they must, all the, they must be credentialed and the HR, the personnel office, the city would be um, in charge of laying that out. But our analysis from focusing on appointment removals is really that this is simply another way to exercise values by the charter committee. Um, they have these options laid out before them, and cities wishing to promote more citizen engagement in government might lead in an option where more appointed officials are now elected, um, and so on and so forth. So next power we focus on were veto powers. Um, we focused really on exemptions to veto powers themselves, because this is where charters differentiated themselves. In every city charter we looked at, the mayor has an authority to um, veto in legislative and budgetary matters. But some of the exemptions we looked at were redistricting exemptions, where the mayor cannot um, veto proposals by the, made by the council to redistrict districts. Um, emergency ordinances that are codified in certain ways with either certain time stipulations or amounts of money that can be spent are usually immune from mayoral veto. And investigatory actions. So every time the council or any other body is trying to appropriate or conduct any investigatory action into the administration, that is also a case where a veto might be um, out of question or exempt. And the last two powers we looked at, and I would I have to say that there's some overlap here because as you can imagine, mayoral powers, uh, different charters we looked at kind of lay them out in different ways. So some specifically outline duties and appointments in separate sections. Some there's a little bit of overlap depending on where you're at. But um, we did, uh, specifically outline executive department organization as management and management as the next mayoral power. And within that, we saw three primary um, options uh, according to the charters we looked at. That included um, mayoral department management with council approval. So explicit and specific um, council approval for every executive department decision. Um, and then beyond that, we were also looking at another option where there was still some written language within the charter that was uh, requesting that the council was involved, but they did not need to have specific approval power. And then in a, f a couple cities that we wanted to look at for comparison purposes, we saw a more city manager style system where in those charters, um, the city manager typically is overseeing all executive department decisions, uh, regardless of not or not a, how the mayor's specific powers are delineated. And you know, with an existing strong mayor form of government, you know, we did see that there is some variation among those options to kind of give a sense of what greater approval and oversight and control of executive department positions. Um, can, can give a city council in terms of options. And that, you know, as Andrew spoke to and as we mentioned earlier, kind of depending on the values and what we might want to promote in terms of Flint's charter, some of, one of those options might be best. Um, and then the last mayoral power that we looked into was duties. And again, I would say there's some overlap here as well because specifically, um, Budget is the only duty that is that we saw specified in all of the charters that we looked at. Some of the other charters have some kind of interesting other duties that they specifically have the, the mayor involved with, but budget's the only one that you see kind of universally. And I, I actually, our, my colleagues spoke a little bit to budget earlier and some of the provisions that they were seeing. And what we saw is that in terms of mayor powers related to that, um, some 
charters specify that the mayor is the, the sole person that's named within the charter for having budget responsibility, while others specify a few different executive uh, department officials to be involved with that process. And then another option was to have, again, in the city manager examples, the city manager really manage the entire budget approval process on an annual basis. So we did see options that uh, kind of across the board in many cities that fell in line with one of those three overarching systems of, of duties um, specifically related to budget. Um, I think that might be it from us in terms of an overview. So if anyone has questions at this point or anything there they'd like clarification on, please let us know. I have a question regarding the, um, the, on, on the amending the charter number three. Mm -hmm. As you know, um, our charter, this is the first time that um, it, it's being uh, looked at for revision since 1974. So d did you actually see some uh, cities who actually over periodically uh, does those amendments? I mean, uh, other than um, uh, when, there, when there's a, a, a millage or something like that? We did see some charters, and, and you'll see, I can't speak to what you guys put in terms of that, in terms of amendments, but in, in the document that Andrew and I prepared, we did, um, we did, we do have examples specifically in the, in the appendix of uh, language and what we pulled from charters where we also noted when it was updated. And in some of those cities, um, we, we specifically noted that there were amendments recently and that they've done charter revisions recently. And then we also worked uh, and, and did some research with the Michigan Municipal League to look specifically at what you're talking about to see, you know, what cities um, in Michigan at least have done recent charter revisions to give a comparison on that. and. You know, while we did use Detroit specifically as one example, and we have language pulled specifically on mayoral powers related to that to see kind of what did they shift. Um, and we had a conversation actually with someone who, who sat on their commission um, committee to, to speak a little bit about their process there. So that's one city, but there are a few others as well that we have included here. Okay. Any other questions? I'd like to know, you said that uh, how many cities are doing some changes? Are there a lot or are there just so-so that you have to go really find? Yeah, so I can, I can speak a little bit to that. Um, it was, I mean, cities have done charter revisions quite a lot. Detroit has a couple pretty recently. Um, and we tried, to, we looked um, all through history for that. So we weren't just looking at charter revisions taking place today but also ones through time. We looked at the most recent charter revision right. and how these progressed. So I guess I can speak a little bit to trends we saw, at least in the de Department of Executive Power. Um, one of the large trends, and this is in the report as well, was for um, a chief administrative officer position, like the city administrator in Flint. Um, that's been a trend that since the 70s and 80s has taken off. A lot of cities have started to adopt a similar role. Um, it actually looks like from our research, Flint was out ahead of the curve in the 70s on that. Since then, um, large cities like New York, New Orleans, um, LA have all adopted similar um, administrators to help the executive. Mm -hmm. So uh, we get some sense of trend in that regard, but we didn't just focus on currently adapting charters, we focused on them probably for the last 30 years. Okay. We yeah. also, um, just to add to that, we looked through a list of all of the cities um, that had revised a charter in Michigan, and it, I think, went back, like... It came out of the Michigan Municipal mm -hmm. League Charter Database. They had a list of all the cities that had undergone charter revisions in Michigan. Um, mm -hmm. So we have the link included. I am not, I don't have the full list in my head right now. I mean, what's it, like 20 cities? It was like 10 or 12. In, in 10 or 12? In yeah. Michigan. In Mich that's what I meant, just yeah. in Michigan. Yeah. But yeah. that was not just current. That was in, since Michigan, that was in Michigan's history, sort of 10 or 12 cities had revised their charters. So it's not a really common process. Um, and one thing I didn't point out before, in the first packet, we have included a list of additional resources that we consulted in our research. Um, and there are links to different things we found helpful in case they're helpful to you. Okay. I got a question. Um, yeah. You talked about um, 
The residency qualification? Sure. Could you speak more specific in what qualifies an uh, individual as a, an elected official to um, serve or run for office? So do you mean they, do they got to physically live there or do they just have to have an address? What does that look like? Yeah, so different cities have different restrictions. Um, the primary one, I think in regards to what you're talking about, the um, qualification for elected official, um, is um, address in the city. That's usually what it is um, from what we've been looking at. I'm not sure on the um, total legality. I don't know the legal um, explanation for all that difference. But I know that's the most common thing um, appointments are restricted to, is if you can hold office in the city, you can be appointed to a certain office. Um, or if you can vote in the city, you can have that. Um, but there are also, uh, even more common than that is something like, we, by the time that you hold the appointed office, you have to move to the city three months after that. So it gives you an opportunity to recruit <coughs> nationally or recruit internationally, wherever you can find qualified people. And then it makes them have to establish residency in the city within a certain amount of time after they say, yes, I'll take the job. So I think that was the most common form, but um, sometimes it is linked. And uh, the only problem about linking it to a qualification like holding elected office or holding the same qualification as the mayor is when those qualifications change, then you have to remember also you're changing your qualifications for everyone who gets appointed. So you're at risk of changing too so much. So is that with, I mean, I know state law doesn't allow for there to be residency requirements for employees of the city. Yeah. Is that relevant for appointees? Um, yeah, they, you have to differentiate, um, at least this is what state law has been taken to mean so far, is that there's a differentiation between employee and then the appointee, the at-will employee of the city. So it's civil service versus, um, you think about people like department heads, directors. Um, and it's, that's been liberally construed to, you can't make residency qualifications for somebody hired by the civil service, but somebody appointed in an executive function um, from what I've seen, they can't have um, residency requirements. And the ones we've seen take place after they sign their agreement to come work. Madam Chair and Mr. Cherry, let me address the residency law in the state of Michigan. Sure. Uh, it's very clear in Michigan, and this came about by the legislation about 20 years ago with the firefighters primarily in Detroit and the police office in Detroit. And the law is very clear that there cannot be any residency requirement for any employee, whether appointed or otherwise here in the state of Michigan. There is only the 20 mile exception for volunteer firefighters that have to live within 20 miles of the jurisdiction where they are providing for it. So the only place that residency can be, can be demanded would be of the elected officials and residency is defined by a residence or residence, which would mean where you vote, where you sleep, where your driver's license uh, and those indicias of residency uh, to, to have an apartment and, and Detroit led the way on that with the police when they were in, for, in the old days when they were enforcing the residency, when they could enforce the residency requirements, they literally followed people to see where they lived and all of those things. And there were court cases that defined residency. So that's, that's, that, that, that's pretty clear. The, the imposition of, or the change of residency is, or the residency requirement is beyond the scope or beyond the response, with all due respect, ladies and gentlemen, you do, you're powerful, but you are not powerful enough to change the state, state law. So, so here's a question. If the city treasurer was an elected position, we could enforce a residency requirement, but if it's an appointed position, we can't? That's, that would be correct, because the elect, any elected official of a whatever jurisdiction is, state law requires them to be a resident of that jurisdiction, with one exception that I can think of. Federal state, or federal representatives, people yeah. serving in Congress in the House, do not have to be residents of the district from which they are elected. 
but everywhere else, especially in Michigan, you have to be a resident within the state. And Mr. Chair, you ask about the elected of officials. Uh, Kentwood, for example, has an elected treasurer. There are, uh, I can think of about a dozen uh, clerks as a very common elected uh, position throughout the state. It's not uniform, but uh, uh, there are, there's even one, a uh, elected controller in the, in the city of Grand Rapids that's, that's elected. The clerk is elected in Grand, I'm not sure whether the clerk is elected in Grand Rapids, but there are uh, other communities that have those elected. And those people, yes, indeed, you it, the law requires them. It's not a charter, but the, the state law requires them. Question I have of the uh, group, and for, let me just thank you for the work that you have done and perhaps the issues that you have raised. But the question I have is the Pontiac City Charter that you referenced to, is that the draft charter of 2015 or is that the old charter of uh, 1982? I believe that's the older. Did you reference Pontiac City? Yeah. Yeah, I think we were referring to the old okay. charter. Okay, and how about, I noticed the footnotes in the back, you used the Detroit uh, charter uh, the t 2012 charter and when you did speak to the folks in Detroit with all this cooperation on appointing a, uh, uh, an, a, a an appointee and the removal and so on have they done anything like that have do you have any practical experience whether any yeah I can um, I can let you know on the practical experience of what happened after implementing that so they did have a corporation council and it's straightforward to a point gets appointed by the mayor like a ordinary position in the city but it can only be removed by the mayor and a supermajority of the council um, and the corporation council in this case of Detroit the most recent one um, was uh, trying to enforce what she saw as the charter against the bankruptcy proceedings. And You're then, talking about Crystal McClintock? Yeah. Okay. And then um, was then uh, removed once the uh, new council took into effect. The mayor and council came into agreement and was able to follow the rules of the charter with the supermajority of the council and the mayor and remove her. Move Thank on. you. I, I wasn't done with my um, sure. <laughs> residency qualification issue. And due respect of the city attorney and the other additional questions that you have to um, ask, we have had in the past to my colleagues individuals who have served on the city council that didn't really live in their wards. So my, my point to the clarifications to you and due respect of your opinion is that um, how do we enforce in the charter um, people that are appointed that really don't live in the city of Flint? And that was my question. What, does the residency qualification speak specifically to what does that look like? And then you just clarified that it meant that they have to physically live there, but in some cases, allegedly, they wasn't living there. Mm -hmm. So how do we, as yeah. a body, make sure that we don't repeat this in the near future? Thank and you. the state law has made that hard. Um, so there's state law in Michigan that says that cannot be, um, you cannot place those restrictions on city employees. Mm -hmm. And that no. is, that is a but, question. But, that, but no. council people are elected. Yeah. That's, right. not, I'm not talking. No, not appointees. I'm not talking it. about employees. It's the difference between employees and the elected officials. Yeah. My question back to you was, Qualification, oh, um, do appoint elected officials, the qualifications for them when they talk about physical or, okay, you, you're a registered voter, um, your, your ID say this, but you're really sleeping somewhere else in Grand Blank or Swartz Creek, which, uh, whoever, mm -hmm. you know, but you, you serving as the councilman. How do we make sure that we don't repeat that? Yeah, that's something we hadn't focused on because we mainly focused on the executive, not the elected officers, but it is a worthy point to bring up. That is something we could look into as well. And that is something we'll have to uh, discuss as a commission. Uh, their role is to bring us the information, but I don't think they have that information about how we enforce that particular area. 
Yeah, we can look into other, how other cities in Michigan have tried to do so. But yeah, we haven't really focused on elected, but it is something we would like to focus on too. Okay. Thank you very much. I'd like well, to thank. I, uh, well, I have, uh, I got a question. The, um, when you were looking at the department organization, did you see, did most of the charters designate some of the departments or was it pretty much all the mayor could create and, and you know, merge and, and split up departments? It differed a bit among the different cities we looked at, but in Detroit, for example, part of the most recent revision to their charter included a specific delineation of what departments would be included. Um, but in many of the other cities that we looked at, um, it was not specifically outlined, and it's left up to either the mayor or to city council or to the city administrator. So there's a little bit of a difference. In my research last term, too, it's, um, it seems like that also depends on size sometimes. Yeah. Um, smaller cities might not delineate departments and say they may be created as wi at will. Mm -hmm. um, and then other cities may establish certain departments and then immediately afterwards say these can be abolished or changed or created anytime they want. Mm -hmm. I'd like to thank you very much. I, I really appreciate the work that you're doing. And that, you know, we haven't had a chance to really go through the information thoroughly. And I'm sure that uh, commissioners will have more questions for you. Uh, we will probably uh, have quite a bit of discussion regarding some of the um, information that you've provided. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to say welcome back, Commissioner McKenzie. We have another presentation. Um, we have a presentation on um, uh, city manager form of government uh, by Mr. Uh, Councilman, rather, Paul Hammond from the city of Davison. Madam Chair, uh, members of the commission, thank you for having me tonight. My name is Paul Hammond. <coughs> Uh, you probably know Bill Hammond. He has the misfortune of having me for his father. I was on the Charter Revision Commission approximately 20 years ago for the city of Davison. I'm currently on the city council. I'm in my fifth year there. Uh, you all have a handout, and it has a summary page which contains the guts, or whatever you want to call it, of our charter and our form of government. Um, as I see it, the main difference between a strong mayor form of government and a city manager form of government is that the mayor and a strong mayor runs the city. In a city manager form of government, the council, including the mayor, is a legislative body and they hire a city manager who runs the city. And having said that, I just have two words of advice for you folks that we took to heart when we were on the Charter Revision Commission. The first one is to never forget who you are working for. You're working for the citizens of the city of Flint. You're not working for the city council. You're not working for the mayor. You're not working for a lawyer. You're working for the people of the city of Flint. We had to continually keep that in front of us because we were getting advice, directions, uh, go this way, go that way, do this, do that from all sorts of people. And we had to keep in mind we're working for the people, in our case, Davison. And the other piece of advice I have, and then I will quit pontificating, is that do not afraid to be bold when you rewrite your charter. Now, what I would like to do is to go through, just read through that page, that first page handout, and that gives the 
overview of what, at least in Davison, passes for the city manager form of government. Is that all right, Madam Chair, to do it that way? And this handout is in, is in sequence with the charter, which you have a copy of. The prominent sections of our charter start out at the very beginning with the form of government. That was our first major decision. Once we decided what kind of form of government, then that set the pattern for what we did thereafter. We found that to be very important, and we considered, seriously considered, going to a strong mayor. We also considered going to wards, where you have representation by wards, by the council, as you do here in Flint. We elected to go at large, because Davidson's pretty small, and we felt that the advantage of that was that any citizen in the city of Davidson could talk to any council member with their complaint or whatever it is that they want. And now that's just the way we did it. I'm not telling anyone how to do anything. I'm not pushing a point of view. I'm merely giving information. The municipal form of government provided for in the charter shall be the council manager form of government. All powers of the city shall be vested in an elective council. The elective officers. There should be elected at large in the city of Davison a mayor and six council members. The mayor shall be a member of the council. The council, the government of the city and all its powers shall be vested in the council. The council shall exercise for the city all the municipal powers possessed by the city for the management and control of municipal property and for the administration of the municipal government. It shall make all necessary and properly, proper laws for executing the powers granted to the city. The mayor shall be the chief executive officer of the city, shall be a member of the council, and shall preside at all its meetings and may speak and vote in such meetings as any other member of the council. The mayor shall be the official head of the city for ceremonial purposes. The mayor shall deliver a state of the city message address annually at the first council meeting in March. Statement of policy. It is the policy of this charter that all matters relating and pertaining to the administration of the city government shall be performed by the administration shall be performed by the appointive officers and personnel of the city. The council is responsible for the appointment and dismissal of the appointed officers, but the council and its members shall not interfere in the daily operation of the appointed officers, nor in the management of their employees. The appointive officers of the city should be a treasurer, an assessor, a police chief, a city attorney, a board of review, a city clerk, and a city manager. The city manager. The council shall appoint a city manager who shall be responsible to the council. The city manager shall be the administrative head of the government and under the direction and supervision of the council and shall hold office at the pleasure of the council. Clerk. The council shall appoint a city clerk who shall be responsible to the city manager and shall hold office at the pleasure of the council. The treasurer, the, city shall, the council shall appoint a city treasurer who shall be responsible to the city manager and shall hold office at the pleasure of the council. Police chief, the council shall appoint a police chief who shall be responsible to the city manager and shall hold office at the pleasure of the council. Now, before I take questions, I want to just make one more statement. When we reviewed this, or when this was reviewed by the Attorney General's office in Lansing, he questioned the fact that the city manager controlled the police chief, the treasurer, the clerk, etc., but yet the council appointed them. And he said, do you really want that? And we said, yes, we do want that, because that way a new city manager cannot come in and fire the whole staff all by himself. It has to go through the council. Now, with that, I uh, conclude what I have to say formally. If you have any questions, I'll do my very best to answer. I'm certainly no expert, but I do have some experience. 
Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Hammond, for bringing us this information this evening. I would like to know how are your city council persons elected? Are they elected in the ward fashion or at large? Ma'am, I'm sorry. I, I, I just, my hear, could you repeat it? Your, your council members, are they elected by wards or at large? The council members are elected at large, yeah. We, we debated very seriously about going to the ward system, but we went with the at-large for two reasons. The, the ability of all this, of any of the citizens to talk to all of the council and the fact that Davidson's a pretty small city. Thank you. It only has 5,000 roughly, a little over people, well, a little over a mile square. Thank you. So, um, thank you for your um, presentation. Um, 20 years ago, when you um, served on the charter um, revision, correct? Was it the charter revision? Yes. Okay. Approximately. Um, mm -hmm. Prior to you serving on that, the Davidson did not have an emergency manager. What scares some of us in the city of Flint, that management form of government because of the past emergency manager, I don't think it would be a good sale to the community. And, and, and for your at large, I, when you was talking about at large, and Ms. McKenzie asked you that question, I thought about the um, dynamics in the voting pattern in the city of Flint. The voting pattern in the city of Flint may not be the same as Davidson. And when I say a, the voting pattern, in predominantly low income to moderate neighborhoods, the voting pattern is not as heavy as it is in well-to-do neighborhoods. So if we will try to go to an at-large city council, that will um, mess with the um, lack of representation in a, a particular part of the neighborhoods where people have um, felt that they have no voice and have quit voting, but to have someone that could still fight for their particular area, that's, that's what is positive about having war city councilmen. Thank you for your presentation. Yeah, I, un I understand it exactly. Um, and we debated that, we, we, we talked about that, um, but we chose to go with the, it had been at large, but we very seriously considered going towards for some of those very things that you're talking about. Now, it just so happens that right now on the council, there are one, two, three, f there are four of us that all live in the same little section of the city, but yet, I, and I'm one of the four, uh, we don't favor our section of the city. We look at when we, and I know this for a fact, and I know these other people pretty well, we think of the city when we think of Davison. We're not thinking of our little quarter mile section up there in the northwest corner. We're thinking of the whole city. But that, I can understand exactly what you're talking about. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Councilman Hammond. And I'm sure that uh, the uh, commissioners will be reviewing your uh, charter. We shall move on uh, with review and approval of minutes. We have no minutes uh, for tonight. Um, public comment on charter issues. I don't believe we have any speakers. Good evening. My name is Paul Herring, and as I heard you talk about the compensation plan for city employees, I'm wondering if there's a way to encourage people to live in the city of Flint. And I know you can't state it by salary per se, but could you add a 10% bonus as like hazard pay for living in the city? <laughs> I don't know if you would call it hazard pay, but it could be some kind of bonus because you are available to us. You're within that 20 miles 
and we can access you and you should be compensated for it. Just a thought. Thank you. Mr. Harry. That sounds good, hazard pay, but I think we would end up with the same thing we have today. We have people who have residency in the city of Flint, their driver's license, all the credentials, except that their families live someplace else. And to me, that's a critical part about being a resident. If I'm in Flint and my wife and family are up in Traverse City, I'm not really a resident of Flint. Well, I think one of the things we need is uh, uh, basically uh, what uh, Kettering is doing at this moment. They're offering a uh, $15,000 uh, forgivable loan to encourage their employees to move into the areas, three neighborhoods surrounding the um, university. I think uh, we need more of that. And as a matter of fact, Jim and I both worked on uh, the um, uh, Imagine Flint um, task group uh, working towards that. So uh, we, we need m more of the uh, institutions to take a look at what Kettering is doing. I think that, um, uh, and, and also, you know, we, we need businesses and other entities to help encourage people to move to the city or stay in the city. Okay, um, can we have a very quick report of committees? Um, finance? I did pass out a four page uh, summary of two last meetings we had. We got snowed out at our other meeting of the committee, but uh, I want you to focus on uh, I don't know if it's your top page or your second page, but the, uh, um, I think it's designated as our fiscal year uh, 2017 budget. Just the bottom line there, uh, the total we came up with for planning our next year's budget was $40,080. So it's a little less than our current year we're in, but we thought that was adequate to uh, do the business of the charter. Um, the March 10th is our current budget that we're in through June 30th of this year. And um, we have a uh, substantial amount on the bottom line. And at our last meeting, which was held this past Tuesday the 8th, uh, Heidi presented um, expenses for the upcoming um, uh, outreach April 19th and we were able to incorporate, incorporate that in the budget already that we have, so she's all set. That's about it. That's all. I Summer. have a, one question regarding the current budget. Um, mm -hmm. Did we include the, um, the clerk's office for copying? We can put that under materials and supplies. I, I think, all yeah, right. we've got enough there. Also, we'll need a motion to accept the 2016-17 budget. Question? Yes, ma'am. Yes. I would like to know why the facilitator for community meetings went up $200. 2016 budget, it says $300. 2017 budget, it's $500 per meeting. I'd like to know why it went up $200. What are they going to be doing different than what they did this time to warrant a $200 raise? Well, there, I, I'm not sure. That's just a projected cost we thought we'd put there. Um, I, I don't know if we'd have to um, use it all. <laughs> use it all or not, actually. But it is there holding that, that line item in place for us. We can't foresee what the venues will need from us as far as money. So we, this is a projected budget at best. Thank you. Now, I believe um, we used a local person to um, to do our last uh, com community Delma. meeting, yes, and we as did. you know, for the um, meeting that was held in September, um, we used a um, someone out of the city, out of the out of the state, as a matter of fact, and yes, so I think all of, of that mm -hmm. uh, plays in, a part in the cost. Is that correct? Right, because 
I believe we had travel in there for her also. Yeah. So, um, I attended a couple of the meetings with the facilitator, and um, although I respect the facilitator, I just don't. Um, I really, I think five hundred dollars is a lot. Even three hundred dollars is a lot. Can you, can you hear me? Oh, this thing fell off. Yeah, but um, I, I do kind of think five hundred dollars is a little steep for some facilitators just to come and facilitate a meeting for two hours. I mean, Bill Hammond could facilitate a meeting, <laughs> yeah. you know, and do a good job or some other. And I'm not saying, I just think that is a little bit high, the $500. We will certainly try to keep it lower than what's budgeted, but uh, that is a placeholder. So, even though it's 500, we may not necessarily pay the 500. Correct. We may pay lower than that. We just, okay. Mm -hmm. mm. Madam Chair, even though the budget is at 40000 have we just dropped the ball on trying to raise money? No, we have not. As a matter of fact, uh, that was, uh, we've had a serious discussion with the Finance Committee regarding um, raising funds. And um, Mr. Uh, uh, Richardson did bring to our attention that um, there's a process that we must go through in order to raise funds, and so we're going to get more information. I hope he's going to head that up uh, so that we can, uh, for because we, you know, we, we need funding not just for our meetings and, and, and for uh, community meetings, but also uh, for our um, ballot. And so uh, th there are some stipulations that we'll have to go through, and so we'll be working on that. All right, thank you. I move approval of the budget. Support. Any more questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Opposed? Are you done? I can't hear everybody. All right. Opposed? None. Yes. Opposed? No. Opposed. Okay. Okay. Motion passed. Okay. Okay. Uh, next is our. Um, Public Outreach Committee report. I'll make this pretty brief. And I'm passing out a handout. <laughs> if you're the commissioner on the end, you don't have all the attachments. I'll email them to you. Oh, I didn't send that. So just take one of each of those. OK, um, the first thing I want to mention is we do have a website that is in development. And I sent a link to everybody to check it out with the password. Um, and thank you again, Commissioner Cherry, for helping us um, put the funding together for that. And uh, I do need to uh, let you know that we will um, <coughs> be waiting for the OK from the um, city attorney uh, for use of the city's logo on, oh. that, on the website. OK, thank you. Uh, so we'd like. All of the feedback, instead of asking for specifics tonight, just to keep it, uh, keep the meeting moving, could you guys email me or just call me with anything specific that you have uh, between now and tomorrow? We'll try and get some final changes to them over the weekend. Okay. Uh, next, the community meeting coming up April 19th on wards in the Flint Art Community Our Voice. Just a copy of the ad and a nice article about our work that we've been doing on form of government discussion. One more so, item before you move on from the from your budget. You, you will need to remove the in kind from the clerk's office. That will actually be a cost. Okay, I hadn't gone over this yet, but we I'll make that note. Okay. So the community meeting on April nineteenth and uh, it's going to be from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. at Asbury United Methodist Church. Uh, with, at Asbury United Methodist Church, and so in the center of the Flint Art Community, Our Voice, there's an ad with all that info. Um, additionally, this is a change from the meeting date that had been in some of our previous information of March 22nd, so there will not be a form of government meeting on March 22nd. It has been rescheduled to April 19th. 
Um, the next meeting of the Public Outreach Committee is going to be on Monday, March 7th. Uh, that's going to be City Hall. Oh, I'm sorry, not, not March 7th. March April. Um, April. April. Thank you. No, let me look here. I thought it was March 21st. Yeah, me all confused. Okay, sorry about that. It's going to be March 21st, and uh, that's at 6 o'clock p.m. here at City Hall. 6 or 6.30? It says 6.30 on here, but we've been meeting at 6 o'clock. How many um, more, excuse me, I don't mean to be just, um, how many of the, this schedule that we have in front of us that we need to change the hours? So we can do that all together so we all won't be showing up at 6 30. well all of the public outreach meetings have been at six o'clock all of the finance committee meetings are at 5 30. all of the general commission meetings are at 6 30. so just that one yeah okay okay the next thing i wanted to mention was this list of meeting supplies and the individual um, expenditures that was emailed to everybody earlier a couple days ago. I want to make a note that I added on an additional item at the bottom from what you had in your email, what we talked about at the meeting, and that was for marketing because I'd forgotten about advertising. And I have in here a $500 cost for the two different advertisements uh, that we should do, which is the Flint Art Community, Our Voice, which is actually right here, uh, and the Courier. So we have an estimate of $500 for those two ads together. And that would actually come out of the budget line item that uh, we have here under number six marketing, under outreach. So a couple of highlights on here. Uh, we're making sure that we have enough materials for meeting supplies for not just this meeting on the 19th, but a couple of the meetings coming up down the road. And it also includes funding to get some sort of larger items that I think are really important. And I just want to highlight that we're asking for $500 for a projector so that the Charter Commission has a projector to take out into the community for our community meetings. I think that's important that we provide that. It's very difficult to rely on um, our community partners to provide for that. Additionally, uh, we're going to include two easels to put chart paper. Remember, Quincy, how you had to chart on on the table? We'll chart on, on a you know on an easel instead. Will be kind of easier for people to see during a meeting. We also have included in here money for some display stands. So those would be for little trifold brochures that we would create a bro brochure to talk about our work. So we'd be creating a brochure to talk about our work. And the display stands would be 50 of these display stands that we'd put out in the community with our, our brochure and information in there. Um, there is a note on here, and this was mentioned, that the copying is going to need to be uh, changed in the budget. Is that correct? Yes, we need to add um, a small amount. Do you know how much? Well, it's only for the one, um, this, for this particular meeting coming up, so. Okay, well, um, I do, well, we should talk about that because if it is, oh, not at this meeting though, uh, if it's a cost that. Uh, it won't, it shouldn't be substantial. Okay, all right. So I'm requesting approval of the items here with the note of the copies that we're going to have to add an additional cost, which should be minimal. Question, question please. Mm -hmm. The easels projector display stand. Once this commission is dissolved, who owns those items and where will they be stored? Oh, uh, I suggest that we allow them to remain with the city council and clerk's office so that they can be used by city council for community meetings and programs. I'd like for the clerk to make sure that that's placed in the minutes, that these items, the easels, projector, and display stand, after this uh, Charter Review Commission is dissolved, 
those items will remain property of the city clerk's office. Okay. The other question that I had, the copies, is that additional monies or is that money coming out of the finance budget printing cost? Probably come out of the printing costs. Okay. Yes. Um, I don't know if there's any way that maybe that can be placed on your um, on your projection so oh. that we'll know <laughs> that it's not an additional cost because a few moments ago we it was said it would be a minimum cost, which tells me that's an additional cost. But if it's coming out of the finance budget for the CRC, then it should be placed instead of in kind. It should say from the CRC Finance Committee. That think that's clearer. Yeah. So we don't get confused. We're adding more money at a later date. Right. Okay. No right. problem. Thank you. Great. So I'll move approval. Support. Any more questions? I got a question. Um, I know he just said it, but just for the records, um, I asked him about the Flint Journal. Um, publicizing in the Flint Journal, why did we not choose to use that as a, another source? Because everybody don't read the Flint or no. the, um, the what, what you call the um, other one, the, we use the, Flint the Courier. Yeah, we use the Flint Journal if they will print it without cost, but to their ads are just too high. And so that's why we don't use them to, to actually do an ad, but we always send them the information so that they will hopefully print it as a news story. But um, ads are just extremely high for the journal. I'm sorry, Madam Chair, I have one more question. Um, are we having a uh, public outreach meeting on April 7th? Is that the same as the advisory committee that's on our calendar? The date is also April 7th. Is that two different committees? Oh, um, I'm sorry. I had misspoke. Our next public outreach committee meeting is going to be Monday, March 21st. Then we're going to meet on uh, public outreach April 4th, and advisory will be April 7th. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, thank you. I have one more thing Opposed. I wanted to oppose. Oh. I had one more thing I wanted to share, and this is um, we did have a meeting this week, uh, the public outreach committee, and we talked about the outcomes of the community meeting, uh, the two meetings that we've had. First one was back in January, and you should have attached to this. Um, infographic, except for you, Janelle, you don't have the attachment, I have to send it to you. The uh, information from the outcomes of form of government from our January meeting, and then some information that came out of the meeting in February. So I tried to condense this down into a easy to describe way of what, what I believe we heard from the community on form of government. And I wanted to really talk mostly about this in committee of the whole, because I really feel that this is something that I want to share in that committee of the whole sort of realm. Uh, but please note that this just really was my way of trying to describe the input that we received and what I believe we heard from the community in a way that was easy to understand. And um, it's really still a work in progress. That's all. All right, thank you. I think it would be good for our, our uh, board students to have this. Can you um, email that mm -hmm. to them? Okay. You might okay. throw all this stuff away. Are there any other questions for the Public Outreach Committee? Thank you. Okay. Um, we have no general communications. Or written correspondence, receipt of petitions. 
Mr. Uh, Introduction of proposals. Jerry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, proposal number two introduced public notices by Commissioner Cherry. Proposal number 23 introduced uh, on the legislative branch, introduced by Commissioner Fanoff. And proposal number four, 20, excuse me, proposal number 24 introduced uh, on the executive branch, introduced by Commissioner Fanoff. And those are in your packets. And then there's one note on proposal 24 there, uh, which uh, Commissioner Fanoff and I had uh, emailed back and forth about. We wanted to make sure you know on 4-203 executive departments, excuse me, 4-202 on executive staff, letter C, says there shall be no more than 10 principal staff officials serving at the pleasure of the mayor. Um, that was amended in, in the 2014 election to be five. So we'll, we can make that change in committee of the whole when it's proper. Okay. All right, so we have no second readings of proposals, correct? Correct. Okay, motions, um, no third readings, of course. Unfinished business. Um, Attorney Lesson, do you have anything at this time? I, I have a couple items. And I, I emailed these to you earlier today, but I, I don't know if everybody got them. I do have hard copies. And again, this is uh, some information regarding the manager, um, uh, strong mayor form of government. Uh, this is. Uh, I, I thought a pretty well done uh, survey. It's uh, from Hawaii, the, uh, from the, the, the city. In Hawaii, as you know, city and county is the same form of government. They don't have distinct cities and, and counties. It's sort of a, a consolidated regional government. And then if you did not get one of those, I have, does anybody, would anybody like a hard copy? came to my attention from the city attorney's office regarding compensation for, or waiver of compensation for commission members. Apparently, and I, I've not gotten into this, but uh, apparently some commissioners feel that they don't want to, to take compensation for their, their services here to the community. and. And I, I appreciate that. And what we have to do, ladies and gentlemen, again, this is uh, an opinion that I have for you, if you would uh, take and pass. Uh, Attorney General, everybody else in the state has already said, you've got to take the compensation. We can't, by agreement, do less than that. But the opinion does not preclude or does not, and as a matter of fact, even invites you to donate your compensation to the city. So when you get that check, if you want to just endorse it payable to the city of uh, Flint, uh, that would be a way of, of doing it, and as a matter of fact, probably a better way of doing it to keep a, uh, uh, a paper trail of showing what contributions, and you can do a, uh, a contribution to a, a nonprofit to take off. That's kind of a hidden benefit uh, if, you, if you contribute it rather than uh, uh, not taking the, uh, the payment. So uh, those of you, to, to, to get you guys compliance with the law, those of you who have not filled out your paperwork with the city, I ask them to provide me copies of that uh, so that, and this is, again, like I say, I want to keep you guys on the straight and narrow. 
Would you fill that out and then I'll get it back to the, uh, to the HR department uh, as is appropriate. And I don't know who needs or wants um, those. It's all done. He's, it, it, has I don't anybody think not submitted their paperwork to the city? Okay, if everybody's done it, that's the, then, I, then it's golden, and uh, maybe I'm a, a day late and a dollar short uh, on that. Uh, I'm sorry, but uh, that was. Could you communicate with the city attorney and let them know where we've submitted our stuff? All right, that, that's great. Super. I, I will do that. And uh, thank you. That uh, makes it easier for me. I, and that's all I have, except I <clears throat> have to. Uh, beg some sort of indulgence from Commissioner Richardson. Uh, I still have my uh, project. He asked me to uh, do a survey of various forms of voting, wards, at will, hybrid, um, flipping a coin, whatever ways of voting there is. And I'm, I'm doing that, putting that together for, just again, it's an issue identifier talking point to, to uh, just to get council thinking about that. I'm real interested in the flipping the coin one. <laughs> okay. they, 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 do use, they do use that from time to time to make decisions. Drawing of straws, cutting cards. It's called by lot. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Question. Question for Attorney uh, Letzman. Thank you for this information that you provided to us. The question that I have is, if we write, endorse the check back to the city, or if we give the contribution to a nonprofit, how does that affect our filing of taxes? How does that affect your filing of taxes? Yes. That uh, under the, uh, uh, there are charitable deductions in your federal and state itemized deductions, if you, find, if you do a, what, 1040 EZ, they don't have that provision, they just average it out. But if you do the long form, the, the 1040, there's a provision uh, for the uh, contributions to schools, to nonprofits, to churches, uh, and to government. Government entities uh, are on that list and you can take that off as a, uh, a deduction off of your adjusted gross income, if you want to get technical. Thank you. And do the, do the city send us something back? Yes, 1099. The 1099? Okay. And we can donate back to ourselves? To yourself? You know what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> I said myself. So. Okay. I, I meant to the uh, charter. Yeah, we got to move on. Okay. Okay. I would like for you all to take a look at your calendars through June so that uh, next meeting we can, we can um, finish out our calendar for June. So if you've got some outstanding events or something that's coming up so that we may need to alter the calendar, let me know at the next meeting, please. Okay. Um, I don't believe we have any new business. And um, after adjournment, um, Commissioner Cherry will uh, chair the Committee of the Whole. We don't have a lot of time, but we're going to use the rest of the time we have to, to, to work. Okay? Call for adjournment. Who will we adjourn? Second. Support. Meeting is adjourned. Like a majority resident opinion seems to be thus far. Uh, and we're going to have to figure out how to incorporate accountability, transparency. And I'm not even sure if active involvement's the right word. Might be another one, or maybe there's a fourth bullet or a fifth big bullet. The thought is, is that we could uh, put forward, uh, here are the main things we've heard from the community, and here's how we're implementing it into the charter. So once we get going, uh, perhaps when we get down to mechanisms for enforcing the charter under accountability, we'd have another bullet that would show where in the charter you're going to find that information. Because it's going to be a complex document. Not everybody's going to want to read every piece of it, but we're going to want the community to know how they can find the pieces 
that are most relevant to what we heard in the community. So, um, again, uh, very much not set in stone, but just trying to lay out there what I think we've heard in transparency, access to information, um, and that would be both to the city council having access to information from the administration and the public having access to information. Uh, transparency being just knowing how city funds are being spent and what the priorities for those funds are. Um, that could be incorporated into the budget process. Transparency in hiring for key um, process or hiring processes for key staff. So in some cases it might make sense to actually have those some of the positions, I don't know if you guys remember when Megan Hunter was hired, there was a lot of open meetings where candidates, or maybe it wasn't Megan, there were some other positions. Is there any that, that we did that? Okay, so maybe that's not happening. Maybe it's, I'm thinking of probably hiring consultants for, for like the planning process. But again, just this was mentioned, hiring, <laughs> transparency in the process. Okay, active involvement. That would be um, one way that could be achieved is through mayor and key staff when needed to be present at council meetings. So we heard that a number of times. People wanted to see the mayor and council at meetings. Uh, government that is accessible to the people. So a government that people can uh, reach out to and can respond to their requests. And then increasing public involvement in decision making. So. It's more of a response to this lack of ability for citizens to be able to actively participate in their government. We need to ensure that we have lots of avenues for that public involvement to take place. So my thought is, is that we could continue to refine something with this group that may represent you know, what we're really trying to achieve and this would be some kind of way to put that information out into the community in a way that is understandable and accessible. Heidi, I have a question regarding the um, increasing public involvement in decision making. Is that, uh, you know, one example that we've done is with, with the master plan. That was the involvement, but what are some other areas you're looking at or, or that came out? Well, so these are intentionally written to be vague so that we can debate and talk about what that might look like. So, I mean, we're gonna have to really get down to more detail on what we think that might mean and how it might be incorporated into the charter. And I think this is gonna really require us to have more of these committee of the whole meetings mm -hmm. on a more frequent basis because we're not gonna have a lot of time to really dig into these issues if we only have half an hour at the end of the meeting. Yeah, well, I think with the next, I know the next meetings, we don't have anything else, so all, you know, we can, we can use all, uh, basically all of our time. <clears throat> so that might mean um, more opportunities for public involvement in the budgetary process, or uh, having more frequent community meetings out in, in the wards you know, annually, or it could mean changing the way public comment happens at council meetings to be uh, earlier in the agenda versus after three hours of discussion. Those are some suggestions, right? Mm -hmm. Commissioner Richardson, did you have something on this topic? Yes, I did. I, I was struck by um, how these uh, accountability, transparency, active involvement are kind of like values. And that um, the uh, Ford School uh, students pointed out um, that uh, uh, that one of the recommendations they heard from the Detroit um, Commission that was rewriting their charter was that to identify what those values were that are important for for the community as a guidepost as as we write the charter and the, there seems to be uh, uh, a kind of a coming together of those of those ideas mm -hmm. uh, that you've um, translated here into accountability, transparency, active involvement, and, and there may be some others too. Um, it, it, what strikes me is that efficiency and cost effectiveness is not one of those values that seems to be a, amongst them. I wonder how that will fly. Thank you. Do you think that 
that either of those should be among them? Um, I do. Yes. Um, how long are we going to keep going on this until we decide? We're, you remember that we were going to decide whether we're going on a strong mayor or we're we going on a manager. When are we going to make that decision as a body? That's uh, because if we keep going on, it will be there in June, July, and people still asking us questions. And our decision has to be made on which way the, we're going to go. And are we going manager or are we going strong mayor? So we need to make a decision uh, soon. We keep getting information, but we're not making a decision. I, I think what has uh, delayed us getting there is that we wanted to hear from the public. And now that we have several or, or a couple of community outreaches that have gotten to the subject matter with some uh, comments, I think now we, we can get down to the uh, decision making. But I, I think we needed to hear from the public because certainly the public is who we're serving. And I'm, I'm the, to the question that you posed to Jim, should those items be included? Certainly that was some statements from the public, some, some efficiency in government. If we dial back to some of the comments, some efficiency should be um, incorporated into the charter. So. So, did, so, Barry, did you want to take up Proposal 3? Which is the estimator? Proposal 3. I got it. 1 301? Yes. Yeah. Wow. Should, should we go forth with it now? Or? Or you said you wanted need, to, so I was... No, I, I guess what I was saying is, you know, the outreach is study doing these going outreaching, getting the, getting the opinions. Do we have enough to make a decision? That's, that's my question. As a body, do you think, as a body, do we have enough information to say we're going left or right? What, do you, what did the body think as a whole? That's, that's my question. Unless we want to put it off another, to another body of the whole, and because uh, we got information from Davison, we got information from the Ford uh, Foundation Group, so, if you're going to read that information and then make a decision, I'm just saying I don't think we need to keep holding this up. If I know we're working on strong mayor, then when you make decisions for the rest of the charter, it's going towards strong mayor. But if we make a decision to make it go toward city manager, that's where we're going. So then when we go back out into the public, we can tell them that. At least we made one decision <laughs> in six months. More. Well, so you're, I, it sounds like you're asking the opinion of commissioners. Right. I, right. I feel comfortable with the strong mayor hybrid, as it's ter as we're terming it here. Mm -hmm. If the if if the decision is, uh, or if, if someone uh, proposes tonight to um, for the for on on uh, proposal three. We can still do amendments, correct? Especially with the, the, the those portions that that mm -hmm. are hybrid that we've been looking at. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it would be good to just kind of talk about what everyone's experience has, has been thus far in the community <clears throat> involvement process, as well as your own experiences um, and thoughts about it and maybe somebody could bring forward a formal amendment to the proposal that we'd look at maybe at a, a future meeting, but we could, in, in a general sense, just talk about form of government. So what I've heard is that I think people still want to elect a mayor, but they want 
maybe a little bit more accountability associated with the mayor's office. Yes, that's what I heard too. And <laughs> well, wouldn't we? Wouldn't that make common sense? That's just common sense. So adding on their accountability, what do they want? You remember when we go to these meetings, you might have one or two people hollering out the loudest about whatever they like, and then the other just join or don't, and then when we get ready to bring, remember when we get ready to give this to the public, we have to soften it up, you know, so they can digest it. What we learn here, we learn a lot, and it's, it's heavy. But when you get ready to give it to the public, how are we going to explain that? So that, we have to take those things in accountability. Well, I, I heard that they do want a mayor elected at large, for sure. But it's the duties of that mayor that we get into the murkiness of the, the whether it's strong, whether it's a manager, it's, it's the duties of the mayor, it's, it's the appointments of the mayor. And I don't think, I, I don't know if it's clear to the public what you would call what they're seeking. Strong, I think the labels get in the way. Yeah. I think okay. the labels yeah. get in the way. I agree yes, with that. I agree with you. I agree with you. I agree. Yeah. Um, there's a couple things that I found pretty helpful in looking at the different terminology. And this was one of the handouts from the February 18th community meeting. And I have extra copies of it here if anybody no, I think I got it. wants it or wants to look at it. So it's, it's in uh, this agenda packet. Do you guys need a copy? I got a couple. Mackenzie, you got one? Okay. Anyway, here, if you guys want to take one and pass them on if you're interested. So this was the five different sort of variations on form of government or differences between the strong mayor and the council manager. It differentiated mayor, oh, what they called it, um, strong mayor they called political, council manager they call administrative. And this is based on Fredericks and Johnson and Wood's study, changing the changing structure of American cities, a study of the diffusion of innovation from 2004. So I found this and then somebody from our advisory committee who also um, teaches government pointed this out to me which really made me feel like that was a, a good chart that kind of explained it a lot. Uh, and he shared this with his students. So what I did is I wrote on the top what, what I think we're commonly calling these different terms, strong mayor and then mayor, uh, strong mayor slash hybrid, which is what I put on the sheet here. And the terminology is tough because in different places and talking with different people, we're calling it different things. Mm -hmm. There's not a standard terminology across the board um, that everybody uses and, and understands. I think that's, Heidi, what, why we need to find one that we want to use and continue to use that through all our meetings in the community and so forth. Mm -hmm. So then they get used to hearing and then they can recognize whatever the one we use so to their understanding. Like mm -hmm. you said, it's several different ways and different people look at it differently. Mm -hmm. But we as a body got to use the same one all the time here and at, in the community, in meetings. Mm -hmm. And I do want to also point out that on this chart, if you take a look at our current charter, we already fall in the hybrid. strong mayor slash hybrid category. Mm -hmm. We are already there because it says that um, that's when you'd have a chief administrative officer, which would be a city manager or city administrator. And those two terms are actually really the same thing. The only difference is who, who appoints or selects that administrative officer, right? Because in a strong mayor, uh, according to this chart, there is no chief, exec chief administrative officer. The mayor is that lead person. But in our current form of government, we have a city administrator that's appointed and, and serves that function, so we're already 
in the mayor slash hybrid. So right. I, what I'm trying to say is this is kind of like where we already are, and we're just tweaking the, 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 details, the details in order to make it function better. It's kind of where I feel what we're doing, we're, the direction we're headed in. Okay. So, um, I, I think it's important that we did the public outreach, but I also think it was important that um, people like um, Mr. Hammond came here and presented. Because when I'm looking at this, I'm seeing some things in here that um, I like, that make sense. So I'm trying to think outside of the box, outside of just going to the public. Not only do I think outside of the box and want to listen and review um, this package to see what makes sense, because when I'm looking through here, I would like to see um, the in here it say the mayor shall be a member of a council. That may make sense to me, even though we may have a strong form of government, because one thing I wanted to do serving on the charter was I wanted to go and attend city council meetings and committee, and that's what I've been doing since I've been on this charter, is attending council meetings and attending the committee meetings just so I could be able to see how it <laughs> runs. And when I attend those meetings, it gives me the opportunity to see what could be improved in the city charter. And I know a lot of times when I'm in meetings, they be saying, well, um, I got a um, question about the um, human resources department or the police department or the fire department and they not here. Or I need the mayor to ask, answer this question and she's not here. So in this right here, when I'm looking and say the mayor shall be a member of the council, that makes them obligated to attend council. Not to say that we can't have a strong mayor form of government. So I respect that we need to move on, but I think for me personally, you know, I think this stuff is helpful for me to look and see what in here that um, the appointees, officers of the, you know, the um, city manager, the clerk, I may like some of this in here. So I think this is was important and his presentation was um, needed for me. Mm -hmm. uh, Madam, Ch Mr. Chair, I'm sorry, <laughs> Mr. Chair. Um, Councilperson Heidi, if I'm looking at uh, talking your mic, if I'm looking at uh, what you've given to us, each item that's numbered, we read it across, and that's what people said according to that particular statement. Mm -hmm. In item four, mm -hmm. it's proposed that council persons only serve two years instead of four. So what you're reading from are the responses from January 21st, and each table worked together on a set of questions, those same questions at the mm -hmm. top, and they came, those are the answers that they wrote down and then shared with the group. So each of those represents a, a group of probably six or so people who sat together and came up with those answers. So then we tried to synthesize all that down, and there were a lot of very good suggestions and ideas that I think we can look back to multiple places in there for ideas. And a lot of these, these things have, um, that, that were on the sheet, we're trying to interpret and bring that, bring that forward. We're gonna talk about ward structure. So we weren't really there to talk about city council uh, and terms of service. So this next meeting, we're gonna focus on the wards, the role of council, and things like two or four year terms at large or word structure, that kind of thing. The other question that I had, it was not even a question, it's a statement. Today on the news, uh, Representative uh, Sheldon Neely is trying to put a bill through that states the city of Flint will obtain a water ombudsman. Hmm. I'm wondering if there's any way, if in the charter, we do put the ombudsman back, that that be part of the ombudsman's duty instead of trying to have a second person, a second ombudsman, just put it under that one person. Uh, I would say no to that only because if the ombudsman is doing the whole city, mm -hmm. 
that's a lot of work. That, that's just really a lot of work. I'll just I, look, yeah. I, would, I'll, I would say have the ombudsman for water mm -hmm. individually, mm -hmm. but t attaching it on to, because the ombudsman is going to have a full-time job just dealing at the police department. Mm -hmm. Then they have also dealing with uh, individuals inside City Hall. I think that would be, and that means that you have the ombudsman, then he or she would have to have several investigators. Mm -hmm. And that, I don't think we have that kind of money. That's why I was. thought we were talking about former government. We were talking. Well, that's government. under uh, number table four. Yeah, no, I, but mm -hmm. I, I, I thought we were talking about former government not reviewing the. The table discussion pieces. Right. Well, I'm just trying to obtain some clarification, yeah. Councilman Richardson, she because of my absenteeism. Yeah. And ombudsman was on listed under table four, and so mm -hmm. that's why I brought that up. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I'm waiting um, to when that bill stated. is available for public reading to be able to read it and bring it to the uh, the uh, commission. The other question that I had under table five where it says strong mayor, and then it says why, and when you flip the page, we'll have a law background. Can someone clarify why that group said that? Because I don't know if all of the mayors that we've ever had has a law background. Hmm. These are just suggestions. Yeah. You gotta remember that. I know, I'm just asking why was, in, your, in the discussion process, okay. why I, was I wasn't that at brought that, up from table yeah. five? I wasn't at that table to hear that, so. You know that's tough. Do you? I think what what it was is um, uh, even when we had the um, group discussions and people wrote it down, even we just still wrote it in this package. We still wrote it in this package because we just felt like we need. We all needed to know what everybody was saying. Not to say that we want to put that in there. So it's just she didn't leave nothing out. Thank you. Thanks. When you brainstorm, you put everything down. Mm -hmm. So it has to be weeded out later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts on Proposal 3? Jerry, um, when, I, when I think back about uh, our experience over the last, um, since 1974, when the new charter came into place, and um, we put into place this, uh, strong mayor position. Um, I got to thinking about uh, accountability and transparency, uh, which are high values that, um, that the community has talked about. The uh, accountability on the part of the, of the, uh, of the mayor, chief executive, um, comes about every four years, or if by some process of trying to recall if people disagree with, with the decisions that are made by a large enough group of, uh, of people. Um, and it strikes me that the, uh, with, that the mayor's office and the mayor um, are kind of shielded from accountability with the community in a lot of ways. Um, that there's not, a, that, um, that, that, Information and decisions can be um, can be made, and uh, though and the response they may not be good decisions, and they may have uh, negative consequences that we've actually experienced over the number of years. Um, without enough uh, uh, mechanism in place for holding a, a mayor office uh, accountable. Um, I think about um, some of the folks that got appointed to key positions uh, that weren't qualified for those positions by mayors in the past. Um, and that goes back in time. Um, I think about um, budget presentations that have been presented to council um, with um, information that couldn't have been correct at the time at which was presented in terms of the of the resources that the city actually had and, 
and spending more funds than we really had. I think we had experience about that. That created uh, um, some of the negative conditions that, that, we, that we ran into. Um, I'm concerned that, um, you know, there's an old saying that if you control the information, you control the decision. And with uh, the way our per current system is set up, with all of the information about what's happening within our city, uh, has to go through the mayor and the mayor's office. Um, pr the decisions then uh, get limited just to, to, to a mayor making all of the decisions and council trying to make a decision based upon limited information. The only way the council gets information is if it comes through the mayor or the departments or what the mayor decides it wants to, to make, make known. Um, so I think that, that the way our system currently set up is that it, there is not enough accountability or transparency um, that, that's in it. Um, there's not enough um, accountability about um, hiring of key people into positions. Um, I think if you go back and look at the history, even back to the very beginning, the very first mayor of the charter back in, in the 70s, that um, folks that were hired into key positions really were not uh, trained or qualified for those positions at all. And I think that uh, we have a history uh, involved with that. <coughs> so those are my concerns about how our current strong mayor system is set up and why I've been inclined to try to look at uh, different approaches because um, I think that we need to have uh, professionalism in how uh, services get delivered for, uh, to us in the city. <clears throat> and I think we need to somehow or other be able to have um, a way to assure that um, those people who are in charge of making those services delivered uh, are qualified and have the ability and training uh, to be able to do that um, and to do that properly uh, and appropriately. Um, and I don't think that those checks and balances are, are in place under, under our current system. Um, well, Jim, so whoever one, you... One, the one thing that, that though, that, that struck me, though, that uh, what, from um, what Mr. Attorney Lutzman just presented to us uh, in an email with that um, kind of an evaluation of the two different forms of government um, that struck me a lot was that in terms of quality government, it didn't make any difference which form of government we had. It was kind of the conclusion that uh, my takeaway from, from reading that, those particular papers. So I'm kind of torn right at the moment as to exactly the direction uh, uh, to move in. Because on the one hand, I want to make sure that we have uh, the delivery of good quality uh, services by our government. At the same time, I want political leadership. Uh, I want uh, strong political leadership uh, that sets a direction for where we're going. Um, strong political leadership that can advocate for the needs of this community uh, and can be, uh, can be heard and, and accepted in the halls of power in other places around the country. I think that's important. Uh, I think it's important that we have strong legislative leadership as well in terms of, of members of council. Um, and that, uh, but I also think it's very important that council and administration work with each other and are not pushed and placed in a position where they're constantly having to do battle with each other. So those are the, uh, those are the issues that I'm struggling with as I think about which form of government, and um, and trying to trying to label something um, uh, as a talking point um, is um, I, I think uh, doesn't get at solving uh, the issues that the issues that we have. So maybe I guess it's in the, the devil's in the detail for me, and I'm sorry to take up so much time uh, on it, but. Um, um, 
as you, as you know, I have been um, talking about council manager form of government as an alternative that we, ought, we should look at. And the, and the reason for that is to try to see what we can do about improving, assuring the residents receive better services, the, good, the services that we all deserve uh, in the city. So that's why I'm arguing with myself about it back and forth. Yeah, to piggyback on what uh, Jim just said, uh, a prime example was several weeks ago, not several weeks ago, most recently with our water situation, the council president, current one, was asked about plans for the city's remedy to such. And there's, there was a couple of plans he felt was out there, but he knew of none that were being talked about because it had not been presented to the council. So there is a disconnect or a information gap to a certain degree that's hindering our current process. And with that said, the labels that we put on stuff, I'm not sure the citizenry is sure what, when, when we say strong mayor, what are we talking about? Uh, Jim said it excellent here. He, he's after some checks and balances. He's after some transparency. These are words we throw out here. But we, we want to make sure the public understands what they're asking for in their charter. And I think they're asking for just plain and simple language that says, I will receive the services for which my tax dollars are being given for. Fair and simple. <laughs> what are you <laughs> well, The last thing I can say is that when you elect, elect someone, you have to make sure that person can do the job. And no matter who we put in there, even if they're at a manager's position, or if they're strong mayor, the public depends on that individual to do the job. And as we learn, if they don't do the job, we can call them to the desk. It says it in the charter, but nobody uses it. And you have to remember, if we go back maybe the last two mayors or three, no one is using the charter. That's why it's not working. Right now, it's not being used properly. And I think if it was used properly as it is, it needs some tweaking, but as it is, it would work. It would work. But everybody is selfish and want their own little. Well, I do think there's a good point on the communication issue, because the only way yeah. the council can get mm -hmm. information information yeah. is to From the issue a subpoena, right? That's the only way you can force somebody to come in front of the council, and that's not necessarily the most cooperative way to get Well, maybe we, and that's yeah. a tweak, making sure that whatever information that the mayor has, that the city council should have, so we can make a proper decision. We shouldn't, be, we shouldn't be a council over here and a mayor over there. They should be combined in some kind the of information way. Information needs to flow I know, at the Jim, same time. I, I hear you. Doesn't that sound a little bit like manager council from a government? It does. No. Yeah, it does. Because once again, the manager runs the whole show. But the manager works for a council. All right. The manager right. You know what? Time's up, so I'm <laughs> just shut up. Oh, but just I, to your agree, point, I Jim, agree with all those. Uh, I agree with everything Jim said regarding, yeah. you know, yeah. how we, the the the, the outlook of, of what it should look like, how it sh how the mayor and council should work together, and all those things. And I, I still feel that um, those are things. Some of those things that we can write in as amendments, uh, that hybrid. I think we keep forgetting that. That's what the people have said. You know, they want to, they, 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 they listed what type of government they want, what form, but at the same time, they've added some things to it. And I think it's important for us to look at those things they added to it. And those are some of the same things that we've talked about, uh, you know, because, you know, uh, making sure that uh, the budget process is, is properly done and not, you know, the council receiving the budget at the last minute, those kinds of things. We, you know, 
there's things that, that I think we can look at to add to it, to, to give it some substance, you know, to give it, give it some type of uh, enforcement. Um, I, I was sitting here thinking about, um, I concur with everybody, and I hear you, you, you over there preaching, Mr. Richardson. Um, mm. But I, I think about um, the, how the school board run a system. The school board is an at-large school board members, um, and they, um, a, they elect the superintendent. So I was just thinking about how they would they run a, I know it's they not, hire. they, huh? Not they, elect. They, they hire. They hire. They, they, yeah, they, are, they hire and they go through it. So that's just something to consider too. The superintendent basically oh, is the city manager mm -hmm. for the school board. Right. Mm-hmm. That analogy. We all, do we have a problem with the superintendent managing the school board? I mean, because that's basically, they don't, they don't run for office and get elected by the people. They get appointed by the right. school board, which is at large. So the school board almost is kind of like a management form of government. And it's been, I don't know how long it's been that's, like that's that, right. but that's a good model to go by. Huh? Oh. Commissioner Fanna? I just wanted to add to the, the question about information and access that if we were in a council manager form of government, the manager would still have the power to um, present information in the way that they want to present it to council. So there is the way to, you know, make things appear a certain way or whatnot. And you know, it goes back to the question of the character of the individual uh, and their team. And that is something that, as Jim had said, and as I've read in some of this other stuff I've heard, that doesn't, you know, the effectiveness is not based on the type of government you have. It's, it's in the details, as, as um, Commissioner McGee had said, and it's in, uh, it's in the, the process. So. We, we, we know overall that the community wants to see a strong mayor slash hybrid, and um, I say that from the perspective of that's what came out of the community meetings, loud and clear, but we do need to just like look at the details in a way that can in increase those elements that we talked about, and some of these other ones, like uh, Efficiency. You know, we're going to have to talk about that. I don't think people want to talk about that, but you so, know, that is something to think about. Commissioner Richardson raised his hand first, and then Commissioner oh, Wesley. Oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. the, the thought went through my mind when you said that the um, that under a, a manager council form of government that the uh, manager uh, could um, uh, control the information, but um, I'd like to sort of uh, ask in a rhetorical kind of a way. Um, if your boss asks you for information, are you going to withhold some of it? No. Because the manager works for the council. The council is the manager's boss. Mm -hmm. So if the boss says, we want information, the manager should, has to produce it or get fired. Big difference. Commissioner Wesley? Mm -hmm. Well, he said it pretty good there, but I'm after some professionalism also, and I think the manager form brings with it some of that professionalism. Just to tag on. Hire a professional manager. That's what we're thinking. See, if you have a strong mayor, you put it in there that the strong mayor have to hire a professional manager. <laughs> Not a bad idea. I know, I know, Jim. I think it's a good, you know. <laughs> yeah. You know. <laughs> Mr. Chairperson, I have a question of Attorney Letzman. Let's say uh, by some divine act we have this charter ready to go on the November ballot. And it's a city form of city manager form of government. And it passes. 
What happens to the mayor that's now in place? You become a part of the city council, right? What? The, the, what the, 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 the mayor, mayor, the elected the officials are allowed to finish their terms. Yeah. Okay. And the transition to the new charter, whether it's two years or four years for the council members, manager, mayor, that would all be transitioned in after their elected terms expire. We cannot shorten the terms of what the people have voted for. Thank yes. you. That's fair. I'm done. Other, other <laughs> thoughts on the former government? I know this. I know this may be a surprise to some of you, but I'm leaning towards city manager council. No. I've been talking with some of the city councilmen, and some of them really want that form of government. So I am also. I agree with Jim. Um, because I've been seriously thinking about that also in talking with some council persons. But I want to be clear. I haven't made up my mind yet. I haven't either. <laughs> I'm still, I, I, I really have not. I'm, you know. Uh, Attorney Lesson. Uh, may I just share with you folks, even though that Pontiac eventually went to the strong mayor form of government, they, and take a look at the Pontiac Charter. They put lots of restrictions on him, getting reports, or her, getting reports on time. Instead of annual reports, there were monthly reports. The budget was to be the council 60 days before approval or so on. But Commissioner Williams is absolutely right. Charter is no good unless you enforce it, unless you go with, the, you know, everybody abides by the charter. Okay. We, we know that. But the biggest argument, or the biggest concern that the folks in Pontiac had, and folks in Pontiac had, are kind of sitting in the same seat that mm -hmm. you are, is can we, uh, and, and this is, uh, and I'm not disparaging Pontiac or, uh, in any way, shape, or form, because this came from the commissioners themselves. Do we have those qualified people running for office or who would run for mayor somebody who has those qualifications that a city manager would have, a master's degree, competence in finance, competence in land use, competence in engineering, competence in public safety, the all of, or in training and so on. Typically, you don't find that in an elected mayor. And that was the, the, the big thing. And we, we spent evenings trying to say, can we put in requirements for the elected mayor that he have a master's degree or that he has certain qualifications and we can't do that. Mm -hmm. And likewise, it would be very difficult to do to restrict the mayor to say that you must hire a administrative assistant or a deputy mayor or whoever, you know, the, who would carry the heavy water here in town that has to have those agreed. The, the manager or the mayor, the elected mayor has to have discretion, chemistry with the person that he works with. So we can't restrict them too much in right. terms of who they, they appoint on that. Are you saying that it's maybe not good for the mayor to say he'll hire a person that's a professional manager? Oh, I think that would be ideal. That oh. would be great. But I'm not sure that we can do that by charter. Oh, okay. Right. okay. That's what I was saying. Right. Okay. So we can't put certification requirements in the charter? We c we could, but is it really workable? Sure. That's the question that we have to have. You know, we could put the certification. We can put in certifications that are required by state law. For example, fire department has to have certain uh, uh, fire officer three or something like that. All of those. A uh, assessor has to be assessor one, two, three, and four. You know, all of those. You know, we can say. You have to be state qualified, but then if you say that the administrative officer in the mayor's office has to have what qualification, whatever the qualifications we decide that they should have and they would be good qualifications, the mayor may say, no, I can't find anybody 
with whom I can trust and I can work with and, and, and so on. And I have to have somebody that I have, uh, you know, the chemistry works or the harmony works or so on that I have confidence in and I can't just hire anybody. So it makes it a little difficult for the elected mayor in that situation. Mm -hmm. I, I just, I don't want to just drag it yeah, out. But throw that out elected it. mayor should have sense enough to know that he's not smart enough to know everything. I would hire seemingly someone that's been in that field before. How many, mayor, how many examples of mayors who don't have do you want me to give you? Right, yeah. Well, you already know that multiple mayors appointed their campaign managers as the administrator. Right. right, and they don't have the uh, right. abilities. I, un I understand that. I, I'm just... And the whole, uh, the whole that, purpose of an appointment... I'm sorry. I'm, I the whole purpose of an appointment is to give a somebody a reward. That's right. It's got nothing to do with qualifications. Just we'll right. We'll fudge the qualifications. Well, that's why we have a charter, and they're supposed to be following the charter. Seemingly, when they're sworn in office, they don't never say that we're going to abide by the city charter, our, our fourth. Maybe we need to put that in there. Is in there? Is in the old? It is? Commissioner McGee. Yes, Mr. Lentzman, you, um, a moment ago you said that in the Pontiac Charter, things like... Um, reporting at certain times and so forth. All of those things are in that charter? Uh, that's the charter that we proposed. That's okay. the charter that failed by oh. a couple hundred votes. Okay. Uh, and I, again, I can tell you lots of reasons why that charter didn't pass, but you know, there were, I don't know, 5,000 people that voted for that charter. There were 5,000 people, in, or 10,000, I don't know the number. Exactly, but there were thousands who wanted a change in Pontiac. They wanted better government that didn't. I, I'm, I'm afraid, though, like anywhere else, that the status quo folks, those are who are in office, and that's why you don't have an elected official sitting here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because they, you, the, you don't want to keep the status quo, you want to mm -hmm. do something new. Uh, they campaigned strongly against the, cha uh, the charter mm -hmm. because it shook them up. Mm -hmm. And you, you will, if you make some changes, you will find that you're going to have to be faced with the same thing. You're going to have to be campaigning right. in favor of that campaign. charter, and we have to be careful of that 60-day gag rule. Well, I, we, we're already at a loss, in a sense, with the word manager in this city as right now. If you say we want a city manager type of government, Everyone already think that the city is being ran by our governor. <laughs> okay, that, I mean that's just we have to be realistic. That's what they think, and just so happened since we elected this new mayor and she came out and start doing something about the water, maybe that's hey that's that's what we want. And what position is that? That strong mayor. So we have to listen to what the people say and at the same time have them enough sense to look up in the future, give some, some elbow room for them to make some decision because we're just making it right now. This is gonna last for another 50 years or more. Mm -hmm. So we have to give them some elbow room. Mm -hmm. And uh, I make a motion that we adjourn. <laughs> motion to adjourn has been made, is there a second? Excuse me. After adjournment, I would like to make a statement briefly. Would you like to make your statement prior to adjournment? No, sir. I do not want it recorded. It has absolutely nothing to do with the city commission. <laughs> okay. 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 Um, <laughs> All those in favor of adjournment? Signify Aye. 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 Opposed? We are adjourned. To the